afternoon. I hope to share some light on this today. Um, if I get excited, I'm passionate about what I do, I always have been. Um, I've listened to others today and this morning, and I thought it was great. Uh, the work that we base what we do on comes from others. Alan, Bree, Rosin, uh, Alan, Vidreen, and I'm going to forget some more names because I have can't remember syndrome. Okay? But there's a lot of work that we develop, and also we're practitioners. While listening today, there were some thoughts that came through my head. Um, in 1966, um, I'm quite a gypsy too, by the way. I went to school at Evangeline Elementary. And the neat thing about going to school at Evangeline Elementary, you didn't have to wear shoes. I thought that was great, okay? And uh, probably about 1977, I was home on leave and I got to hunt on the south side, excuse me, the north side of Branch and Air Ridge, which I'm also from Cameron Parish, with Mr. John Richard, he's in his 80s now. But we were in a location that was mineral soils on the side slope, okay? And I was in a stand of marshy cordgrass, Spartanus patens, and it was not what you expect to see in a marsh. And it was broken up, and in between was probably some of the bluegrasses, either vaginatum or the, you know, there's a panicum. And I was amazed at what I was looking at, but I didn't know what I was standing in, okay? Um, so I'm going through a bunch of thoughts, I'm kind of scatterbrained. South of Iowa, southeast, excuse me, southwest of Iowa, about directly cat corner, there is a colony of Jamaica sawgrass that I found about 20 years ago. It didn't just get there, and that's not the marsh. You wouldn't expect it, but that's probably a remnant mare. Okay. Um, ducks and geese, just a side thought about ducks and geese. Ducks and geese follow water levels in the coastal marshes. Before we took the Mississippi and Central Flyway out and made it cultivated land, those ducks and geese came south. Typically what those <coughs> ducks and geese do is when the marsh is at low levels or lower levels, that's where they're at. When it rains and the water comes up, they move north into the rice fields. What are the rice fields? Historic prairie. Why wouldn't that have happened then and why that, wouldn't that have been a grazer? Okay? Uh, earlier today, I, I've seen two sites in my short time that I know of that were prairie that were destroyed. Okay? Both, one of them was in Cameron, one of them was in Calcasieu Parish. One of them was Temple Mounds that had inner mounds four and five foot deep. It's now a subdivision. Okay? The other one was not a very good site but it was loaded with the atrus acidota. We harvested it with a flail back to get what we could from it and moved it. But what I'm thinking of, the earlier presentation we saw today where there was 80 acres, had they been able to sod cut it and just harvest that top two or three inches, yes, you would have lost some roots. But if you could sod cut that, Nothing else, maybe you could sell some of those sods through a fundraiser, or you could sell that as part of me, that should be on the other side of the road right now. But anyway, you could have sold that as a money raiser. All right? Introduced species. What a pain in the butt. Tallow trees. Um, we are also in Texas, we're battling uh, deep rooted sedge. Um, I have recently seen acres and acres of balloon vine, which I thought I'd never see. And then, of course, our tallow tree. Native species that give us problems are papyrus, when it gets in a group. And then, um, oh shoot, morella, serifera, uh, can't remember the name right now, wax myrtle, okay? It will give you problems if you don't control it. They probably, you guys controlled it years ago. It's back. A gentleman at uh, Trinity River National Wildlife Refuge, scuttlebutt from my standpoint, he did not tell me directly. He, he killed all the tallow trees as best as he could, and they all came back. And they asked him why he did, because he said to prove a point, that you really can't get rid of it at times. 
Um, let's see, what do we have here? Fire and burn bands. Sometimes the best time to burn them when we got the cleanest burns, historically, were before there were burn bands. <clears throat> now when it's a good time to burn and I don't have a fire, where's our gentleman that was just spoke? I do not have the expertise that he does, but sometimes when we would like to burn, you can't because it's burn bands, and then we deal with wetlands, and for the last two years, we have not been able to burn because right now we have six inches of water on coastal prairie. Okay, uh, I have a timer on too, by the way. I got seven and a half minutes done. Anyway, and then the practice of prairie <coughs> restoration. That's what we're trying to do. But Larry Allen gave me a statement that was probably the best statement we could have ever had. And it was the early successional pathway to prairie. Because when you tell folks that you're going to make prairie, I don't know how many thousands of years old it was. I don't know. We don't have that. We don't have any old soils. They, in the prairie, they've all been gutted by rice farmers. I got kinfolk that are rice farmers. It's not their fault. It's the way it was. Water leveling, every year when they water leveled, every other year, it removed tons of topsoil. Okay, so we're dealing with just not good situation. Um, can you, you guys see that? You know, what I mean? that's a stand of Florida past Palo. We actually have a true prairie remnant. When our young fellows went out there, and I call them young, they're 30, they're goat getters. They went out there, they said, Bill, it's full of pay tins and a whole bunch of other stuff, and I kind of didn't believe it. I did believe it, but it was not until I walked on this site that I went, oh my God. That's when I called Chris Reed and brought him out there. Um, and you know what? It was a lot. It has a lot in common. Dave, you're the anchor to a lot of the things that we do, so it's all right. Uh, but anyway, it was very similar to that prairie that I found myself on in Grand Chimere. I believe there are prairie remnants down in the Chimere Plain. I also, also on the other side of Texas, a friend of mine works over there. He's a biologist for the uh, southeast Con Texas complex, and he has about seven remnant sites which they graze, by the way, in the wintertime. Wetland mitigation, try not to get into too much of the regulatory stuff. I can tell you this, we work with some very good people in the Corps of Engineers. It's their job, they have a hard job. We go toe to toe trying to get things done. Uh, Corps of Engineers, EPA, and then of course in Louisiana, uh, Office of Coastal Zone Management with LDNR. Uh, impacts in the wetlands, when you have an impact in the wetlands, jurisdictional wetlands, anything that's adjacent to a traditional navigable waterway, something you can float a boat in, or something that may be relatively permanent waters that has water in it year round or season. Familiar in impacts that you may be familiar with, that we all do. Residential, retail, industrial, mineral extraction, energy conduits. We're going to get to the energy conduits. I think there's a great opportunity that's come up a couple of times today to make prairie corridors out of those. Mitigation banks. They're, these are not ours. Ours are, in, ours are in red. But this is an interesting thing. This is the early pathway to early successional prairie. 2,400 acres, 2,450 cents, June of 2003, there was a big gap between 2003, that was like a scene, they initiated all of it, okay? And then in 2014, we developed another uh, 1,600 acres of prairie, early successional prairie, okay? So there is movement. That's kind of why I'm here today to let you know that there is a part, while there are impacts to wetlands, there is some good coming out of it. Does the wetlands, and we'll explain, talk about this a little bit later, is that the wetlands that we try to provide mitigation for are those wetlands that occur on historic prairie soils, which that list came from Larry, and we created a soil map, which, and we'll see it pretty much mimics the historic prairie. And we'll see that a little bit later. I'm sorry I jumped around. Um, so, anyway, quite a few. And every once in a while, you find something that you put a seed out there, like I found some, what is uh, Texas cone flower? 
ran to Florida. I found two flowers of it last year, and it was just like, yay. Texana. Texana. Thank you. I have, can't remember the syndrome. We won't put the other word on it anyway. Uh, the, the location of those banks you just looked at, and like I say, the, these other banks are not ours, however, as an industry. <clears throat> now, you say, well, this is great. I wanted to throw this in real quick. There has to be a market to sell the credits of, the wet, of these wetland acres. If those credits are sold, then others will be developed. Right now, as we know, with the oil, the oil industry has is, is come to a halt like this. It affects us, too, because what is that? Pipelines, uh, Sasol. We did the mitigation for Sasol. Sasol took out four, 750 acres of wetlands. Okay, I actually hunted and fished some of those wetlands in Westlake, another place I lived as a kid. All right, but it took those out. But what did we do? We turned around and came back with either 19 something or 2,000 acres of mitigation acreage in historic prairie. Okay, this is us. Now here's another. There's there's my home file. Okay, and look at this on the other side. Three years ago, I'm walking out in that, that, that Sassol Prairie, and there's ladies' dresses sticking out of the behavior. It doesn't have, what is the, the coefficient on? About a six? Is it a six layer? Do you remember? It depends on your species. Yeah, there's two of them, and I think this is Bernalis, I'm not sure. But anyway, just to see it there, and then when you start looking around, you see one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and I had to be there at the right time because it doesn't last very long. And then this is a, this is a, this came from seed we planted. We did plant and distribute. But learning, implementing, and practicing. That's what we're trying to do. All right. One of the things that when we were first putting all this together, we did moss lake first and we just kind of did it. We used native seeds and we used raised seeds that, that, that came from commercial producers. I wasn't really happy. I like the native seeds because they had about 120 species in this conglomeration. Okay, but anyway, the question started coming up, well, what do you do, what's the list, what can you count? All right, so first of all, we're working in wetlands, so we work with tobacco weather species. We work with species that favor wetlands. If they don't favor wetlands, and we haven't, remember we have no net loss of wetlands, that's a national policy. Okay, so what we do is produce wetlands. If it's not a wetland, we can't sell it as credit. But anyway... We took Deer Park, Nash Prairie, Milwaukee, White Lake, private property, the Florence Glove, and the Sassol Prairie, and we took those list of species that were factor wet, and we listed them down. And then when we did, when we did uh, Delta, we started ending up with some fact up species, so I started including them. Not fair, but I did anyway. Okay, so anyway, we had a list, I'm sorry, I got a point around that. We had a list of, 700, of 650 species across all of these. That's a pretty damn big list of chapter weather. And then if you notice, the species that are listed at each site, and that's the native, and then the next number includes the non-native species. And you know what's really neat about some of these? This the site at Sassol that we're working on right now, it's not at Sassol, just calling it that, is that we're watching on a call it the, the natural weediness of the native seed is actually, because we're not controlling the land, which we could do some grazing now, I'll tell you that. But we're not controlling the land, we're not disking it, and we're not fertilizing it. The native seeds, or the native species are coming in and competing with Bermuda grass. At least that's what it appears to, and I'll tell you, Spartana Pekins really looks like it grows into it. Now, if that's anecdotal, I have not taken many months. <coughs> Establishing the early successional pathway. First of all, you've got to be in the historical coastal prairie region, on coastal prairie soils. We re restore the hydrology, which restoring the hydrology is we cannot take out major drainage ways that pass through our property and drain other folks' property. If we fill those in, that would not be right because of what we would do upstream. At the same time on our property, we take down rice levees and in, uh, 
uh, drainage patterns with that we dug, that were dug on that land on the inside. What that does is cause water to hold or store. Let's call it water storage. Okay. Uh, native species produce wild vegetative and soil. And there's a little term right here, watershed seed bank. This is kind of reaching. But the watersheds that come into our South Park Bank and also into the Sassol area originate in Iowa, probably about 7, 10 miles, 15 miles to the north. Well, when that whole area floods up and then we're in the end of the basin because we're in the Mermitol Basin, we're, in, we're east of the Calcasieu Locks. All of that area floods up. That's a redistribution of seed. Every once in a while, when you're looking down the roadsides, you will see other species in there. All right, prescribed. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Um, you ruined it, didn't I? Uh, prescribed burning, one to three years. It's been two years since we've been able to burn because of the high water. And we've tried to burn it multiple times. Herbivory and trampling, uh, whether it's ducks and geese or bison, uh, there needs to be some soil turnover in there. That's going to be worked on in the future, but the mitigation banks are not allowed to use graders. Uh, the ecological trajectory, we're all in open ended. We ran a soup now. I don't want to, none of the, the, the matrix you saw a while ago is going to be published. We worked on that probably three or four months. A lot of work went into that. Still could be some errors in there. And we did run a similarity index on it. And there's those different areas were within the 33% range. Okay, they're, they're different, but they're similar, mostly different. Okay, and a term that I like, something that uh, Mr. Chris Lee gave me a few years ago is that uh, native and introduced species have to duke it out for environmental resources. That's really what's got to happen. Yes, ma'am? I have a question for you in that pathway. When you see non-native, uh, potentially very invasive non-native species like Johnson grass or Bahia or King Ranch coming in, is spot treatment with herbicide of those pockets a part of the pathway? Those, we probably won't see King Ranch come in because they're too wet or Johnson grass, but if we see deep-rooted sedge come in, we go after it. We spent several thousand dollars this year on all of our mitigation sites spot treating tallow trees, and right now we have a site in Texas that we're going after the fruit itself. But there's also, and there's also, but there's a catch to that too. Way back when we, when the older bunch in here was in school, we were introduced to the concept that introduced species after they've been here for a while become naturalized. Uh, I'm probably fixing to make some people upset here, but there's a, now tallow trees you got to take out because they'll take you out. Deep rooted sedge, you got to take it out. Coating grass, you got to take it out. But there's a lot of introduced species, and while we don't count them towards our goals, I don't know if you can remove them. Because when you go and you start spot spraying all of those, you're killing its neighbor. And that's not, I would rather put up with a little bit of the bad to not kill the, the natives that we have. You know, so I'm not trying to, yeah, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. But we do go after them. By the way, you're lucky you haven't seen the Johnson grass, because I've seen them growing all along the bayous and mm -hmm. along rivers in Texas. They get to be humongous next year in the winter. Are you sure they're not on the, on the terrace? It depends on what you call the terrace. It's, you know? the, it's the raised area that's drained right next to the back. Well, they were on the raised area, but they can cover it. You know, I'm more worried. Uh, cattails are more of a worry for me and cut grass. Uh, identifying the mitigation site indicators. It's in the historic coastal prairie. It's art to be in the Chenier Plain. I, I know this is my own thoughts, but there are areas I've been in the Chenier Plain where you're on the top, then you move down the side of the levee, and then you get down to this flat mineral area that's not marsh yet. People call that high marsh. However, if it's not grazed, you'll find, if it hasn't been grazed like in Texas, these areas in Texas, 
you'll find prairie species growing there. Now, Larry, is that really a prairie? Because it's just a little isolated pocket. Where does it begin and stop? But I tell you what, if you go down to Cameron right now, because of the storms, and look, I, I'm my wife's from Cameron. Uh, she won't go back down there. They took some serious licks from Rita and I. Uh, but if you go down there now, you see acres and acres of grassland. Um, current land uses, active agronomy, grazing or fallow fields, Chinese fallow scrub, shrub, abandoned land, forested areas. That's what we're going after. That's what we've been able to get that if these areas, if it's, if it's a tallow tree wetland, guess what? You still have to do mitigation on it. If it is a, um, a jurisdictional wetland and it's a tallow tree forest, you still have to mitigate for that. That's thousands of dollars, more than thousands. All right, we've seen these today, the historic prairie, and then based on the soils that were provided for us, uh, Daniel Bollock, um, our team leader, is very good at GIS, he went in and he mapped those soils, and it's pretty much a mirror image. Okay, and that's what we look for, those prairie soils. Now, think about it, think about this too. We do wetland mitigation. We're not, miti we're not creating prairie uplands or upland prairies. However, if we do have wet upland prairies next to the wet prairies, if we have inner mound areas and mound areas, those can be worked in and part of the, the, the model as buffers. Okay, there is credit to be gotten to be received there. Ah. 19, any of the young folks in here? The young folks in here, and that's anybody start, there you go. To start your career, I really hope, I wish that you folks, and I turned 59 this year, I'm still a young guy, but I really hope that while you're in your early part of your career that you go have many cups of coffee with as many 70 and 80 year old people you can that lived on the land, because they may not give you the chemical equation, or the scientific name that they can tell you what was there. Okay? Did that a lot, Cameron Parrish, most of the time. So anyway, look at that. 1940, the prairie. There is our prairie remnant. Right there. And we still have the mounds. One of the things that protected that, now that is on a mineral, that's on a mineral landscape. Okay, mineral soil. And um, it's got 69 native species on it. Now, I have to tell you, the coefficient values on them, uh, wetland prairies don't score as high, from my understanding. And these, this site scored probably about a 4.5 or 4.6, somewhere in there because I think there's more work that needs to be done on the coefficient values to include these wetter areas. But uh, I mean, where we're working at right now is here, all the way down here, up here that we can't see, all the way down here, jump across the body and down here. There's also a bank on the side of us, and then Sassol is way over there. There's probably 2,000 or 6,000. There are probably six, seven thousand acres of land there. Now a lot of that's BLH to the bottom of the hardwood. Okay. Wouldn't it really been great to see that? I'll tell you what, right here in this little crook it's wooded in right now. The mounds are that tall. We're killing it with herbicides. It's got it's got uh, and we're killing the trees. We're trying to stay there's a couple of live oaks we're trying to preserve. But we're taking the trees out to try to get to that natural mound and a mound topography because that's something you don't see anymore. Lands that we look to do mitigation on, and I know there's been different sides of this argument. I'm just supposed to have a green thumb and it ain't money, it's about growing plants. Um, uh, We look for land that has hydric soils. If it has hydric soils, that's the first qualifier. Actually, the first qualifier is it available for purchase. And if you ever wonder why 
mitigation costs so much, we may pay anywhere from $2,000 to $10,000 an acre for land like that. Now, does it, it, it goes for a higher price, and that's not, I don't, I'm not a marketer, but it's expensive. Plus, we have a team of 20 people. We take land from cradle to grave. Now, of course, we'll be in the grave before he gets to the grave, okay? But we put it on the contract, we run our delineations, we get our uh, jurisdictional determinations, if it passes muster, we purchase it, and we start writing the plans, and we prepare to take it back to zero, okay? Fallow fields. Be surprised it's in foul fields sometimes. Ah, here you go. There it is. We have, and you'll see some other areas. The best thing to do to that, we try to just kill it, but herbicides, clear cast, which is about $250 an acre, it works, but you know what happens? Is that only about 30% of it doesn't die. So now you gotta get back in there and spray it again. Now it's a tangled jungle of rubus and everything else, so we're just about to the standpoint that maybe you do have to go in and take it out with a bulldozer. I don't want to do that. I don't want to cut the soil. Crawfish chimneys. I'm not sure what to call that. Some people call them, craw I call them crawfish mounds. But I went and looked it up and they said chimneys and that's what I went with. But we look for sites like this to let it, it's an indicator for us. That's a nice little depression Okay, horse pasture, depression, natural prairie dominated by <coughs> marsh acorn grass and bristle mock grass. But other things mixed in. Hydrology restoration and cattle removal. This is an area that we sprayed. You can see we did go back and spot treat it this year. You can see where there are. Okay. You can see <coughs> where it is. All it takes is one tree on one side of that tree and it's still alive. Okay, but you can see back here we killed all this. But look at this right here. That's some four square grass. Is this a is this a mare? That over here just a little bit of ways away, probably about two or three hundred yards is a platin. Okay. There's metal mounds underneath this. We went in and controlled it again. Within the next year, though, we started seeing, and I'm sorry, I don't know which species right now. But we saw, uh, oh shoot, a couple of species of the golden rods coming in there, um, and Rhinocephalus. We plant marsh acorn grass. A lot of people say, why are you doing that? We're on the coast of the coastal marsh. And marsh acorn grass is very much important. So we, this is a two-year-old flood that we planted on nine foot center. That's expensive. And then coming at it from another direction, we use marsh a trade gallons on 50 foot center, but the idea is, is to put colonies of this species out there so we can grow and spread, produce seed, but at the same time, other species could also come in. But I'll tell you this, the, uh, when we, we went back to the matrix a while ago, there were 69 species. That site is dominated by Spartana patens, but it does not grow like, anybody who duck hunts in here goes out in the marsh, it's a totally different growth form. When you're in the marsh, marsh acorn grass is clumpy. Okay, when you're in the prairie, it's like this. And you look down and you can see the soil, but you look down to it, and right now there's a little species. Chris, I don't remember what it was. It was about this tall, it had a little bit of flower head on it, blue. But anyway, we're looking down in there, and he, and he starts picking these things out, all right? And so there is a diversity, and it's not a cord grass pasture. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, metal makers, wild seed. We, distribute, we distributed that, and then this is clay balls. It rains so much that we couldn't burn, so we couldn't distribute the wild seed. 
and you say, why don't you drill it? Because it's too wet to drill. You can't depend on it. It's not, it's not, it's arable soil, but it's not true. It's arable when it wants to be, okay? We went through five types of clay to finally figure out a clay that would make, this is a drum, rotating drum, like a concrete mixer. And you put the seed in there and you put clay and you keep spraying it down with a little water bottle and it forms these balls. And we went through five types of clay to create the clay balls. It was very intense. What clay worked the best? I don't remember. I don't because somebody else is working on it. I, I, I do a lot, I'm sorry. But we tried, uh, we tried native clay to, now this was to uh, that side of the state. We tried baseball clay. Uh, we just went through a series of it and Brock finally came, uh, our man that took care of this, finally came to a composition that would hold well enough. And I wish, I mean, Russell did some test blocks here too. I didn't put it in there. We have a flail back. Last week or week before last, we were down in Corpus Christi, Texas, harvesting Spartan Spartan AC to put on salty prayer, salty wet prayer. We picked up about 1,900 some odd pounds of plant material, and the way we weighed it out, we probably come up with close to 300 pounds of seed mix. This was a site. Okay. What's that uh, pineland, pineland hibiscus? This is at uh, Axial, okay? We have this same hibiscus on the mounds on our Sassol track in Canada. Why not? Iowa is right below the Longleaf Pine. The Calcasieu River comes down and probably flowed into Black Lake, I mean, Black Bayou, many, many, hundreds of, or hundred years ago, so why not? Burning. Coastal remnant on the coastal prairie. Pay that's why it's important. We took all these trees out, by the way. Coastal prairie remnant next to fresh marsh. Guy cut grass in the background, deep marsh mineral soils that were rice fields. And our beloved tallow trees. There's a lot more prairie out there than I think we give. There's, there's a lot. I mean, once I started doing this, I just started looking around and, you know, it's there. It just has to be uncovered. This is our Moss Lake property. It's south of uh, Sulphur, Louisiana. Today there was some talk about transmission lines. This is a pipeline that runs through here. We were able to get permission to plant this as coastal prairie and we got partial credit for it. Now this company didn't and this company or these companies didn't, but that was brought up earlier today as corridors. And the work that you do and if pipelines are going to be put in and they're going to be maintained as emergent. Why not be maintained as prairie? Uh, ULL now has a seed source. Uh, Mark Tasterek of Metal Makers has a seed source. It's not cheap. It's never going to be cheap. It's 50 to $65 a pound. It's not corn. Sassol PRM. This is prairie, this is prairie, this is Mark, most of Marsh in here, and then this is VLH up here. And there's our pineland hibiscus that's right here. South Park Coastal Mitigation Bank. Uh, prairie, and then this coastal prairie here, coastal prairie here and here. Um, and it varies, it's, it's, it's marsh, it's gonna grow like prairie. Depends what mitigation needs are too. Oh, look at there on the other side. We have whooping, whooping grains? We have whooping grains. Two years ago we had three. 
Last year we had two. I don't know what happened to the other one. But uh, yeah, they show up in the wintertime and they are about right in this area here. We also have lots of sandhill cranes, which I can remember a time when there were no sandhill cranes and then they show, started showing up in the 70s. Uh, Corpus Christi threw this one in here. Well, that's a long way to go to go to work. Uh, but anyway, this is a Spartina Spartina dominated coastal equipment. Uh, this is the establishment area here and here, and this is existing areas that we relocated. This area had been so heavily grazed that probably 60% of the soil was bare. It was not good. And we took out all of the mesquites and weed satchels and probably should have took out Rotama also. Hmm. Y'all see a button? Anywhere on here? I'm trying to get to a button. Was a uh, what do you call those hovercrafts? Drone. 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 We had drone pictures of this, and it was going to show the work that was do going through on a on a mitigation site when we take it over. And the first thing we do is the hydrology work, which is taking out the levees, swelling the ditches. Now, one thing I will tell you what we do earlier in that historic photograph, you saw a uh, the rice levees. <coughs> If the rice levees, which typically go downhill, we don't take them all the way out and leave about six inches because there are no longer mounds in that area and it acts as a terracing system to not let water go too fast. Okay? Well, thank you very much. That's it. <laughs> 39 minutes with the buck. Yes, sir. Uh, Billy, do you see Japanese climbing fern as a new base for We have it in a long leaf pine. That's what we see in our area. We see it, we see it in, our, in our forested areas. I do not believe I've seen it down here. But we do have, uh, what is it, Chinese ladustrum also. And that's a problem. Along with tower trees. No questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the clay balls. Did y'all follow up and just see how those two germinate? Okay, I'll tell you what I did, Larry, and I did. I'm sorry, to, I can show you on my phone. Um, I went out and I made three plots, and it wasn't replicated, okay? I replicated in the rows, and in one plot, it was uh, six foot by six foot, 36 feet. And I put flags out, and each flag I thumbed. Uh, uh, the ball in the ground. I've been out there since then. I have not seen anything yet. I don't know what's going there. And then on the stand on the side of it, uh, I distributed. And then on the one behind it was a bunch of seed that I went out. Oh, the Florida pass failing. In four hours, I was able to hand pick five pounds of Florida pass failing. So that's how big those, those acreages are out there. And I went out and I picked some of that and some uh, ironweed and uh, hmm, maybe some purple plume grass and made some seed balls out of that and put that back out there. So we did we did try to see where it's coming out and then I have some areas where I marked and put it out. It was the best way because you know the other side of that. All right, we go out on the on the set on the Sassol, excuse me on the Sassol site 500 acres. We put out approximately five pounds, a mix of five pounds of seed, commercially produced and wild harvested seed together per acre. 
that's not that much. Uh, Larry and I talked and he, he recommended 10 pounds. I appreciate it. Couldn't get it. Okay? But at the same time, what, and then Larry says, well, you know what happens when the water comes up? He says all the seeds float up to the side of the bank and they germinate where they shouldn't germinate. And then they don't make it. Or they don't make it to the extent that they would have out there. Well, that's the other side of going out and distributing $50,000 worth of seed on an area that's going to flood up. It's good for the people downstream. <laughs> if that's what they want. Okay. So, I mean, there's a, there's a flip side to all of this. Um, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. When you do your tallow control, do you actually cut the entire tree or whatever you have of it and treat the cut stuff, or do you make hatchet cuts and spray into the hatchet cuts? Depends on the size of the tree. Some of them we cut down. Some the, the poison that we, the herbicide that we used this year was a basal spray. The bigger ones we cut down and sprayed that. The smaller ones, you just basically spray them. And from the work that I've seen from the field looking in these different areas, it looked like we were fairly successful. Yes, sir? What, did, what kind of herbicide did you use? Oh, Lord, now you're going to ask me the intensity of the questions that I don't want to keep up with. <laughs> no, we used, on the, on the aerial flights, we used clear cast. Oh, heck. Is it Garlon? I think it was Garlon. I was supposed to say Garlon. Yeah. yeah. You know, but um, people don't like to use, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this nasty word, diesel, as a mix with it. But when you're going after something like this, you know, it's like you need to use it. It kills it. Any other questions? <clears throat> yes, sir? How do you see the demand for coastal prairie mitigation evolving? Okay. The way we were able to, the, the coastal prairie area is our service for, for our bank, for South Park, and for Moss Lake is the service area, okay? We were able to do that. The only way that we can use that for mitigation is if impacts occur on coastal prairie soils. This has all got to be proved out. Coastal prairie soils uh, emergent. Uh, communities, scrub shrub communities dominated by tallow trees, scrub shrub forested communities dominated by tallow trees. If there, if it's already been, um, been a, it's become established as a hardwood stand, there probably will have to go as BLH mitigation, bottom end hardwood mitigation. But I gotta tell you, I kind of disagree with that because in my thought, is that in a watershed, if you take a watershed approach and you get a piece of land, you should put what should be there. And then when mitigation occurs in that watershed, then you should be able to use what mitigation is available because the watershed needs it. Now, I'm not saying that for uh, something sensitive such as a cypress swamp, because I would hope to think that they would go underneath the cypress swamp and come up the other side. Does that answer your question, sir? Well, Partially, but as far as the establishing more coastal prairie, the well, driving force behind it would mainly be mitigation as a way to fund. That's right. That's so right. how do you see the, the, the demand for mitigation, mitigating coastal prairie? As, as impacts occur in that area is, is as fast as it will go. And right now we have a downturn in the oil industry. Okay, and we're kind of on the tail end of that. When it picks back up, when pipelines are put in, installations are, are being constructed and those sort of things, that's when mitigation comes up. So you're the, I guess the answer to that is, is that, yeah, this is 25 acres, 2,500 acres may be all there is for a while until more impacts occur and drive the market. Because you've got to have a market because you've got to remember, this is, this is not me. The company that I work for is not the... 20 individuals that work in it, the biologists and the marketers. We, it's not our money. We have investors that, that, that invest the money for us to do this. And until that sells, it doesn't keep, you know, you have to keep rolling it over. All right, you know, it, it would be, I ran into a place in Texas, we called it the Horseshoe, is my God, the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been on. The upland prairies were full of liatris, 
and muley and other species that I don't even know the names of. And then as soon as I got down to the mound and inner mound, the inner mound areas were full of fat wet furry species. And then you got to the furry, uh, you got to the tallow trees on the sh on the shallow slope. And then as you got up, these these mounds were also wet. I mean, it was perfect. However, it was not in an area that was being impacted. Yes, ma'am. You seem to focus on wet mitigation. Did, um, did your company ever get involved in more upland mitigation? So, like, you could also maybe use. Um, uh, that particular instance happened down in Corpus Christi where it was a situation where a developer needed only, I'm going to say, 117 acres of weapon mitigation. But in order to get their mitigation, they had to buy 317 acres of property. So they received all of this upland buffer in yellow around it. If there is upland buffer and it, if, if there is, uh, if there are pimple mounds, memo mounds, that will go along and that can be figured into the model. But no, we, we really do not develop upland credit. Now you can put carbon credits? That does not, no, we have not. It's not, and, when that, that, and I don't keep up with carbon credits, but is there a real market? My question is, I can guarantee if there becomes a market for carbon credits and we can do that, powers of being going to say go do it and I'll be more than happy to do it. Any other questions? Thank All you right. very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>